In the meadow we can build a snowman And pretend that he is Parson Brown He'll say, are you married? We'll say, no man But you can do the job when you're in town Later on we'll, we'll conspire All right, I can't, this fucking holiday shit Like, between Mariah Carey and you um, All I want for Christmas is a new Christmas song. Hello, welcome to another episode of The Carmudgeon Show. This is Derek Tam Hyphen Scott, and I'm Jason Adam Sandler Discount Camisa. Um, see how nice I was to you? I didn't even call you something rude. Um, it was implied. Speaking of Christmas songs, I have a question. Do you think Santa's sleigh was front wheel drive? It's, uh, the reindeer are in front. So that so would make pull. it. Deer wheel drive. Oh, oh, oh groan. So I gotta get my neighbor. I'm um, leaving. <laughs> I get a deer wheel drive. <laughs> my neighbor get, told me that joke this morning, and I told her I was gonna steal it, so I did. Um, and and now you've burdened so many other people with it. Burdened. I. It's a nice gesture. It was. I, I sing Christmas carols with you. I I give you a platform in which to be mean to me and you take advantage of it. Anyway, so Santa's sleigh brings me to, to things that hold stuff, which brings me to wagons to my neighbor who they really want an R6 where her husband does and she's like, that's crazy. Why are wagons so hot? I don't know, but I have wanted an RS6 since the dawn of time and now that they're finally here, I'm going to probably not buy one because they're $130,000. You can get rid of the GT3 and get an Audi RS6 wagon and it's a lot faster. Depreciation. Mm. It depreciates differently. Yeah. No, I do think that is one of the hottest cars of the moment. I was at the LA Auto Show last month. It was one of the stars. I mean, everyone just couldn't stop drooling over it. And I really hope that this is a sign that wagons are back. Mm, you remember in 2000, like, three, four, when mm. wagons tried to be back and how that didn't work. Like that's when the E60 M, so, so the, the E65 series, what is that, E65? E61. Uh, is that the wagon, mm. is the E61? E65 is like a six In any series. case, uh, so the five series wagon, the A6 wagon, and the E-class wagon, which has been and always will be here. Mm. Uh, but like that was the only time that they, were the last time that they tried to all be here and then they didn't come back ever again. See, I feel like, I feel like product planners for American market just get the wagon wrong. They like continually don't understand what people want. Case in point, Acura TSX wagon was really good. That was a really nice driving car. I didn't but even the, know it was a thing. It's a really good thing. Um, and the, the, the problem with it was the person in charge of product planning did not understand who the wagon buyer was. They never seemed to. And so they made it unavailable with Nav and a stereo and Xenons. And I remember having this meeting with this person like, what are you fucking stupid? Like these are younger buyers who are cool, who are just having kids and don't want the, the minivans that their grandparents had and the SUVs that their parents had. And they're now making a decent amount of money and they want a $30,000 car and they want like nav and tech and Bluetooth and all this other shit. And they were like, huh? And the only, I feel like the only company that got it right was Volkswagen, who had a manual transmission diesel wagon. And so Jetta, Jetta wagon, which became Golf wagon. Yeah, but how much of those did they sell? A lot. Really? They, yeah, actually, Golf wagon far outsold Golf. Um, and when it was available with diesel before that, rather unfortunate Incident. moment. In the, yeah, <laughs> that, that clattery mess which has no name. Um, before Dieselgate happened, I, it was something like 80% of Jetta wagon sales were diesel and 80% of them were manual. So they hit the target market of diesel manual wagons. And anyone who buys a diesel manual wagon is a fucking hero, in my I, opinion. I right? totally agree. Right? But then what did Audi and BMW mess up with the 5 Series and the A6? It's, well, BMW messed up the 3 Series by... Only giving the small motor. Right, we had the, only the small motor, never the M cars. All right, never we, manual. Never well, after the E46, it was never manual. Yeah. Um, and so, and then, oh, no, that's not true. There were E90 uh, 328 manuals. And, but the diesels were automatic only. Yes, correct. And, and sedan only. Right, and when you're looking at the VW case, 80% yeah. and 80%, right? So they're walking away from that core market. And it, it's not like it's a difficult thing. You have the sedan with the right transmission and the right engine. It's very easy to just check two boxes. Now, a manual diesel would have been a different, uh, different situation, but they, they only had an automatic gas which in the case of a, the Jetta for, wagon would for have been which? for the, three series. 
the 328DF30 uh, was available as a diesel. As wagon. a diesel, right? Automatic diesel. only. Yes, correct. Um, right. So you had manual gas and diesel automatic, and that's minimizing your sales. But I think they just didn't understand who would. It's the same reason why so many car companies mess up the fundamental manual transmission thing. They have it in their head that manual transmission buyers are poor college professors who are frugal and want to save money. And that right, was because the case. that's probably the European mindset also, which is that like everyone who can afford to selects an automatic in Europe, like ma it, manuals right. are a sign of like, oh, it's an economy car. Yes. And, and for, for a long time in the U.S., that was also the case. I mean, if you think back to the early 90s, there were, you weren't really around yet, but there were, you know, the Tercel, Toyota Tercel manual was the quintessential poor, poor college professor's car. It was someone who was intelligent enough to buy a good car, and the Tercel was a good transportation device. But, you know, it was like, why would I have a slower vehicle that's more expensive to purchase, more expensive to put fuel in, slower, and, and then is going to need a new transmission at 120K? So it was the, thinking per the poor thinking person's car. And I think that segment of the population has 100% gone away. Um, now that, no, it's not that they're dead, but modern... They have money now? No, not necessarily. But the modern automatics perform as well or better than, yes, right, yes, that's than true. manuals in instrumented tests. Um, and so there's no reason for that. And I feel like the, 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 the product planning case for, for wagons has been similarly misunderstood. And Audi finally got it. Like, do you think it's going to sell, though? That's you always, fuck, yes. You do. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, so. look at E63 sales. I feel like Mercedes kind of brings it over because they're stubborn and because they like the... Ooh, Mercedes brings it over because the E-Class wagon is the most wealthy customer of any Mercedes-Benz product, period. E-Wagon customers have more money than S-Class customers or Maybach customers. Oh, G. And G is the other, the other mega buck. Uh, brand, and I, this is years ago, but I remember some f some statistic like the average e wagon owner has eight cars, right? So this is Mercedes being like, hold on, these people are rich. They're not. They're not. Excuse me. They're not rich. They're wealthy. They have actual money, and so it only stands to reason that if they have a good experience in their e class wagon, they will uh, own other Mercedes, and they're going to buy their kids Mercedes, and you know, and the housekeepers are Mercedes. So I think it's a smart business move. Even the um, E63? E63, why not? Why not? You have the car that's federalized anyway. Put a $50,000 surcharge on something that costs $8,000 to make um, and make a lot of profit. Not to mention the fact that enthusiasts just like always lose it over the existence of that car. Right. And so it's like free marketing, basically. Yeah, it is. And, uh, and, and where I think Mercedes has quote unquote gone wrong relative to Audi, or I should, let me flip that around and say what Audi has done with the RS6 that Mercedes doesn't do is make the RS, is made the RS6 hot as fuck. It's got aesthetically. Fe aesthetically. Fe I mean, it's not just like an E63 is, a, is an E350 with the big motor and the exhaust and whatever, and a fascia and whatever else. That Audi is undeniably right. sex on wheels. Because it has like the same hatch and the same front doors, but everything else. Everything else is different. Big bulging fender flares. It looks the fucking business. And that is what all of us wagon enthusiasts dream of. The fast, I mean, would I like it better if it had like the R8 V10 plus a manual in it? Of course. But that's kind of not really the right thing. Right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. See, I got him to laugh. Um, but yeah, no, that car is amazing. But I just, I, I think, this is my little sociology experiment here, we'll see if I'm right, is that there's always a counterculture, right? There's always the, the, in the, the, the days of the big American muscle car, there was the guy who showed up to the racetrack in his little MG, you yeah. know, and they wanted little tiny stuff. Um, and the counterculture cars were always cool. It started out with the Beetle, too. I mean, yeah. um, and I think we're at a point now where everything on the road is so big and marshmallow shaped and tall. Yeah, SUVs and crossovers. I mean, like Ford, which has said, oh, we're not going to make cars anymore. Sedans are dead. Sedan yeah. might actually sometime, at some point in our lifetime, become the cool body style. The resurgence of Because it's of the... retro. <laughs> I mean, think about that, right? Um, but I think we're poised to, we're almost to the point where. Kids these days who grew up in SUVs are now going to fantasize about something that's long and low. 
Well, yeah, um, uh, dynamically superior and more economical right. and right-sizing for the problem instead of right. having just bigger is better. And is when we go towards electric vehicles, right, range is the biggest concern right now. This, as battery packs get bigger and bigger and things get more efficient, that'll be less of an issue. But at this point, we're, the, the industry is moving towards electric vehicles. Range is the single most important thing for an electric vehicle. Um, and the biggest determinant of range is battery pack and frontal area, so the, the, the size of the front of the car. A low roofed long wagon is far superior dynamically than an, any sort of crossover SUV or anything tall. And that's why Volkswagen just showed that gorgeous long wagon concept at LA also. Okay. It's their, it's their it ID. It has an absurd whatever. name with a lot of Z's in it. Yeah, ID Kazizzle or something, whatever it was, but it was uh, ID was that again. Um, that thing was, it's like longer, it's an inch longer than the US Passat, which makes it three inches longer than the European Passat. It's a long car, but it's got these great wagon proportions. And I think they did that for range. So we could be at the point where wagons are uh, Or you could just be like projecting your own personal desires. I just hope you, that's not the case. But that's, I hope that they're that's the moment at which you were like, okay, boomer, whatever. Well, like also cross tour the whatever the regal wagon. Okay, boomer. Let, let's 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 talk about the wagons that are on sale right now, or, or, or have been recently. The cross tour is fucking hideous. The oh, no, I'm sorry. The, the Accord. The, oh the yes, Accord sorry. Car. I'm talking about the Buick Regal. The Bugle. The, <laughs> <laughs> the Bugle. Isn't that what the you Buick had for dinner Regal. last night? Yes. Um, don't judge. Um, the Buick Regal Tour X, as it's yes. called, is a really good had looking the word Opel. Tour in it. It's a really, really good looking car. It's a Buick. Buick ha sells three and a half cars a year in the United States. Where is the closest Buick dealer to you? I'm you, proud to say that I don't know. It's the only thing I've ever asked you that you don't know the answer to. You know everything. Walking encyclopedia doesn't know where a Buick dealer is. So would you, would you really buy that car? Also turbocharged four-cylinder automatic four-wheel drive, not an enthusiast recipe. No, Great I car. mean, but it's the same recipe as the Volvo, uh, the V90. Yep, and which the, is even better looking. Yes, it's agreed, gorgeous. it's spectacular. Gorgeous. Uh, the A4-based all-road, the A6-based all-road's coming here mm -hmm. to the US, yep. uh, and that will be six-cylinder available. Uh, I don't I know think. anything about it, to be honest with you. Uh, so that's an, exciting. Another wagon you just, uh, oh my God, there was another gorgeous wagon. There was something that's on sale that they ruined its, any of its chances to, I don't know. I wish we could cut this video and come back when I remember what the hell I was talking about. Um, was it European? European? <laughs> European. <laughs> I have to turn. I don't, I don't even know. I'll think about it. I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me. But there was, there was another, there are wagons that, oh, the Jaguar. So this is my favorite story. What is XF? XF oh yeah, there was an XF wagon. It still is. Still is. Yeah, and have you ever seen one on a road? I think I've seen a photo of one, or maybe okay. it was a rendering. I drove one, it was a press car. I've never seen one out on the road in the wild. And it, I drove it actually back together with the Bugle, the, the, the Buick Regal. Um, and it is, it's, it's good. It's not their best driving car. It's the V6, it's not the V8, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and that Buick actually held its own against this, uh, against this Jaguar. But then I saw the sticker price of this car, and I am a wagon enthusiast through and through. I would take a wagon over an SUV any day of the week I have. I've owned wagons, I still do. I would never own an SUV. You would have to be out of your actual fucking mind to buy this car. $75,000 for a beautiful Jaguar wagon that was twice the price of the Buick and had the same equipment level. And by the way, it was $20,000 more than the uh, F-Pace SUV that is exactly the same component set. So when I can buy the SUV for 50K or the wagon for 75, and by the way, there are millions of the, of the SUV in stock everywhere, and because that, they're sitting on lots, dealers will negotiate on them, and then, and then, then, the, re, the, the real price difference is a factor of two. So would you pay double for the wagon? I would say fuck you and not buy any, either of them, just to spite everyone. But I'm not spending $75,000 on, on a mid-sized wagon and neither is anyone else. And this is what I get so pissed off about these product planners because they make these cars like the TSX was unbuyable. They make them completely unappealing and unbuyable to customers and then bitch. Volkswagen just did it. They killed off their sport wagons. Um, 
And when I was, luckily I was in, I was at the Jetta GLI launch actually, and I was sitting next to the, one of the product planners and he's like, I just don't know what happened. As soon as we launched Tiguan, we can't sell a single sport wagon. Like sport wagons sales dropped to zero and I almost fucking strangled him. Like I was in the middle of dinner and I just thought, I just had this fantasy, like just grab his fucking throat, squeeze until he turns blue. Because I had just been looking earlier that day for a friend um, and helping him buy a car and the, the nationally um, published incentive lease price that they had going on at the moment was 50% more expensive to buy a, a golf wagon than it was to buy a Tiguan. And here's the thing, $250 a month versus $370 a month, I think it was, um, is a huge, huge price difference. But the Tiguan has a third row of seats. The Tiguan has a two liter and it's got an eight speed versus a six speed, a one four, and no, like you're getting a bigger, faster, better car with a better transmission, better tech, better everything. Not quite so good on the build quality, mm. but at a, at a 40% discount. Are the made in Germany or Mexico? The Golf wagons are in Mexico. Um, and the Tiguan is either Mexico or Chattanooga, but it's just, it's a better, it's better interior materials. It's just a slightly nicer car. But my, like, who is going to buy the smaller, less powerful car when for 40% less they can buy that? And they just fucked up. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. that is based on the idea that Americans don't like wagons, which I think dates back to like the early 90s. This you is, think about like the early 90s and like all yep. of these people coming off of like uh, Crown, what are the Ford Crown Grand Day. Marquis, right, right. Ford Mercury Grand Marquis, Marquis yeah, Mercury Grand Marquis, and the Oldsmobile Cutlass with the wood paneling on the side, and like that was the ch the childhood. I think car we've of the reached 70s. the limits. I'm sorry of Derek Tam hyphen Scott's knowledge because you're confusing brands and, and brand well, At here. least they're in the same group. They're in the same Ford, group, Ford, but I'm Lincoln, just amazed. Mercury, see you, Ford you, Lincoln Mercury dealer. Mr. Walking Encyclopedia is like, American shitbox here, whew, there's dust all over it. Um, <laughs> yes, there was the Pontiac Parisienne. I mean, there were all these different- Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser, Vista that's Cruiser. a little er Vista. earlier. In, in any case, in Oops. American psyche, there's this, like, wagon was a bad word. And so then, of course, by the time you get to the 90s and you have Mercedes 124, 300 TEs and Audi 200, mm -hmm. 5,000 wagons mm -hmm. and like, I don't know, BMW hadn't really started wagoning here yet. And so, of course, nobody's buying these things, especially if they're 40, 50, $60,000, right. 60, $58,000. A lot of that, a lot of that, sort of out, those cars being out, is a cyclical thing, right? Everyone in the 70s, parents had a station wagon, like the Brady Bunch station wagon yes. where all the kids piled in. And then, you know, the, in the 80s, it was the minivan. And I'm waiting for the SUV to just finally time the fuck out because I'm just not convinced that this is the proper driver st uh, body style um, for sporty applications. I think it's a, like, fine, you want a, a people mover, it works. But you know, you'll note back in the day that Chrysler might have made a turbocharged version of the minivan, but they never made a sport version. And no one ever made sporty versions of anything that was supposed to be a pe people mover. SUV is the first time where the marketing people are like, well, a lot of people are buying this, so we're just gonna make it sporty. And you get stupid things like X5Ms um, and Cayenne Turbo Ss, which I don't think work, like you're, it's inherently compromised and it's a, it's a, it's, it's an internal self-contained argument. We're gonna take something that is all wrong for performance and make a performance version out of it so people can think they have something. What? what? But people buy them. They do. And, and they pay a lot of money for them. Large numbers. People buy a lot of really bad cars in very large numbers. That's true. But, um, but I really think this counterculture of the wagon will happen. I mean, I've had my E30 wagon for 17 and a half years. Um, that was hot shit to a very, very small number of people um, back then. Um, it is now hot shit to a much larger group of people. Like E30s were just kind of old cars. Um, and fast forward almost two decades later and they're the sort of, you know, the poster child of Radwood basically. And I really think the wagons will be part of that uh, counterculture for kids who grew up in explorers. I hope so, I really do. I mean, certainly I feel that way. It's also interesting, like performance wagons, not really much of a thing. Uh, I mean, your E30, I guess, is the spiciest format of wagon that you get at BMW. BMW did make an M5 wagon in the early 90s, E34, which they right. sold 891 of, never in the US. Right. Uh, you could also, like, like in the typical American 60s way, you could get like sort of high option, like really heavy motors in 
like a the Ford Galaxy, you could get the NASCAR motor in. Yeah. You could I do it even in the 80s. You sold three of them. You could do it in really? the 90s, yeah. Into the 90s, the Buick was available with the Impala SS motor, um, yeah. which did epic burnouts. Yeah, um, I can imagine. Yeah, but they, they, you could always get the sort of big motor. But remember, those were body-on-frame frame trucks, basically. Um, and so most people, they thought, would option the big engine for um, towing. Because they could tow 6,000 pounds, 7,000 yeah. pounds. It was outrageous. I don't know why they made my Audi wagon. So your Audi wagon, okay. I mean, I think I'm hot shit with my E30. Uh, you win. Um, so you have a 91, 200, 20 valve Quattro Avant, five speed in pearl jizz white, as I call it. Might be yes. a little bit offensive. Um, Audi pearl white. Is that what's it's this? Pearl white. It's fucking gorgeous. Yeah, it's like, and it was so Audi, like 80s, 90s, to, and the fact that it became a factory color, because it started in the tuner car culture to have like the pearlescent colors. Did it really? Yeah, pearl oh. white, like it was very early 80s, like huh. all those crazy, like, I didn't realize it was a tuner. Uh, BBI was one of the Porsche tuners, and like Strosec, and mm -hmm. all those crazy Koenig, uh, anyway. Uh, and then Audi made it a factory color, which is like, ooh, that's like, they've, they've Back in the day, them. when I was in high school in Germany, my dad had an, an 88, um, 90, 20 valve Quattro in pearl white, and it was just the hottest car. Yeah, um, the same, was it, it's a 20 valve? 20 valve. Yeah, so same, same powertrain, which in itself descended from uh, Trans Am and rally cars. Uh, which is actually the same engine in my Scirocco that's with, with one extra one more cylinder. cylinder. And a turbo. Yeah. Um, that car is so beautiful. You know, it was, it was the f most fucked up thing in the world was we were broken down on the side of the road in your beautiful um, Audi wagon. <laughs> and I parked the Scirocco next to it and it r realizes, look, this stupid Scirocco, 20 years of my life, I know, whatever. But this blew my mind. I'd been looking at the Scirocco for years and, you know, drooling over Audi wagons for years and never realized that they were the same shape. And I mean, of course they sold, I think, it was a one-year-only car. Uh, my Audi, uh, they sold 133 in the U.S. approximately. So on. Only 133 of the 20 valve turbo. Correct. So in 1991, valves. you could only buy a 20 valve. You could only buy the car in one configuration, which was the hot configuration with the manual and the big motor. And before that, there were 10 valves. So you got like 50 more horsepower than than every year before that. Uh, and I guess given the price, they sold 130, and the fact that it was a wagon, they sold 130. And this was the last year for that body style? It's the last year of the body style. So previously you could get it with a 10 valve non-turbo? Uh, you could get a 10 valve turbo Quattro. Right. Uh, and I think maybe a front wheel drive automatic as well, or maybe that was a sedan only. In any case, that was the only configuration you could buy the wagon in in 91. So think of, if we think about it this way, your 91 car is the RS6. For this is a 2020 it is. R6, right? I mean, yeah. In it that it's only available in one configuration. It's the fastest, most powerful engine they could have crammed in that car. Yeah. Um, I got, I hope they sell more than 133 R6s. Yeah, or they're, nobody's going to... Well, my whole argument's done. I mean, yeah. and the wagon thing is Well, and they will keep, they'll be like, see, I told you so. Yeah. There, nobody's going to buy these yeah. things and we'll, then we'll never get it again. I think some of the Audi people were saying, look, this is your one chance, America. Like, right. buy this thing or we're not going to do this again. I think this, uh, this RS6 project internally was pushed by enthusiasts who were like, yeah, we know that people be. want it right. And I think it needs to be a test bed in the same way that 911R was a test bed for a manual GT3 and all, all these other things. Tell me about your wagon. Where, t t well, I know about the wagon. Your fucking wagon's amazing. Um, My favorite thing about that car is the fact that it, like, that Audi raced the 200 in Trans Am in 1988 uh, and they got, well, well, yeah, I mean, they show up, at, so this class is dominated by Corvettes and Camaros and, like, Mustang-based cars and, and uh, Nissan Z cars. And so Audi shows up with a big sedan with a 2.2-liter five-cylinder, and all, everyone else is like, you guys are insane. What are you doing here? Yeah, go home. Uh, yeah. And they hired uh, Hurley Haywood, Walter mm -hmm. Röhl, and uh, Hans Stuck. How did you pronounce Walter's name? Walter Röhl. Wow, pretty good. So um, in English, we say Walter Röhl. In German, you say Walter Röhl. Uh, and you say, how am I? Sorry. Uh, so they got laugh at him. Just make some comment in the comments about like Derek's pronunciation of Walter Röhl. And then, sorry, and Hurley Haywood, yeah, Walter Röhl, and who else? And uh, Hans Stuck. Hans Stuck, yeah. Uh, and they got them to drive this car, and then they, as it turned out, they cleaned everybody's clock because it was all-wheel drive, and it wasn't illegal yet to have an all-wheel drive car, and it became illegal after that season because Audi won the championship. Everyone, Audi won everything with those early quadros. Yes, correct. And then, well, yeah, and then because they dominated in rally once they figured out how to 
do it. How to make right. a turn. Yes, exactly, which is by shortening the wheelbase a lot. Well, and putting a woman behind the wheel who could really fucking drive. Yes, Michel Mouton. Michel Mouton. Uh, oh. and, uh, and so the, the car has motorsports history, and they're, they still sold none of them, and they're still worth nothing, which is shocking to me. But, they, but like, they didn't race the wagon, did no, they? No, they didn't okay. race the wagon. But, I mean, it was that kind of... That, car, I mean, to me, is the ultimate configuration of that car with, I mean, the race cars were 10 valves, and so the 20 valves, oh, that's the... Well, and that. wasn't, was it, what was the next wagon that came later? Was the RS2? Uh, the right? RS2, which was built by Porsche, mm -hmm. um, but before that, there was the, the what became the A6, which was the 100, the right. C4 chassis, uh, S4, which was also sold in the U.S. as a wagon with the same motor mm -hmm. as my car. Uh, and those have a small but rabid following of people who are... I don't think I knew they existed. Yeah, they, well, I mean, yeah, it's an So esoteric. it's a C4 S6. Yeah, it's the first generation A6, right. which right. was previously called the 100. Uh, With but those the were S4. Valve. Yeah, those are, they were called S4s, and right. then they changed the name to S6. Yeah, there was that and period then, of time yeah. between 100, 200, 4,000, 5,000. Like, A5, A, yeah. A4, A6 yeah. thing all emerged. Uh, and they actually put a V8 in that car in the non US market, the S6, at the end of its in the life, wagon? In the C4. Yeah. Wow. You don't get the five-cylinder yeah. magic. The five-cylinder magic. You is, gotta have the five-cylinder. It, it just—it sounds so cool. It sounds like a lot like a, I think a V10, uh, which is a really cool. Which is two straight fives. Noise. Yes. Um, you have video of your your car accelerating or doing this. Yes. Stuff? And we'll put we'll, it right here. It. Hold on. What, now? You want to put it now? No. Now. There is something magic about that that warble. Yeah. Yep. It just and yeah. it's much better in an Audi than it is in like a VW. Uh, sorry, in a Mercedes diesel, which is also five cylinders. Yeah, but they don't rev to thirty five hundred. Yes. Yeah, very smooth motor also. Yeah. Uh, very smooth. Five cylinders have to have very heavy crankshafts and flywheels, so they're very smooth, but they're also very slow to rev. So they're mm. they're not this whom whom whom. You know, they're whom. Very yeah. slow and deliberate. Um, but personality out the ass, especially with the turbo in it. Yeah, a little too much personality at times. Uh, crankiness, whatever. They're very I mean, early reliable turbo machines. Oh, God. 80s. It's been a colossal pain in the ass. <laughs> but I love it. I mean, that's always the, why, why do we like terrible, terrible cars that are so Because they have personality. Because a car but that starts... I don't starts like it because it's terrible. I would like it better if it weren't terrible. Yeah, but if it weren't terrible, it wouldn't be good. If that was a Toyota Camry wagon, like let's say a 92 or 93 Toyota Camry the wagon with the double rear, rear wipers, wipers. I, only, only two of us would care about this. Like that car, especially with the V6, they were not, there was 200 horsepower-ish or something like that. And they did good burnouts and they held a lot of shit and they were constructed like fucking Bentleys. They were so good as cars. Why don't you have a Camry V6? It's got the whole like blobby Japanese dash well, thing, that. which I don't care for. But I don't know, also, I've never, I haven't spent time with it. It just doesn't sing to me emotionally. Because it doesn't have emotions. Emotions are breakdowns. Mm -hmm. I mean, on that rally where we, you know, the, the Scirocco sort of roofline video, you were broken down. Yes. And we did have a really good time. <laughs> yeah, but in spite of, not because of being broken down. Fair enough. But did you enjoy the car before it broke down? Immensely, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, is you know sometimes you have to break down and endure the bullshit to have that good of a time. That thing sounded epic on the road, and it looks good. You know, the only thing that I don't like about that car is it's a U.S. market thing. The U.S. market got the automatic climate control and the power seat controls from your from grandmother's GM. Cadillac. Cadillac. Yeah. Like, what the fuck was Audi thinking? And like, here it is, the hottest wagon of all the hot wagons. It's going to become an enthusiast, like. You know, thing one day, I'm sure they didn't know that, but you know, in my mind, like back in the day, like, we would make this, or it would be a 20 valve on a turbo and a five speed on a do zero to 60 in six seconds. It, and then they put a All GM true. in the ghettoest LED, yeah. like, what are you thinking? That's like when the Alfa Romeos came to the US with the Chrysler radio. Yeah. It's just. Come on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really. It's Ferraris, don't know. Really? Oh. <coughs> Yeah. yeah, or when the, the Maserati is, when it's a still When they broke down what? Who? Where? <laughs> See, speaking of cars, I mean, we love the cars that break, and then when they put Chrysler infotainment systems in it that work, we make fun of them. It's the tax that they must pay yeah. for choosing such an inferior solution, yep. in my opinion. What's the hottest wagon ever? Is it the, that 200? RS2? RS2? It's hotter than 200? 
It's a lot smaller, isn't it? It's a lot smaller. Uh, it's purple. And it has Porsche wheels and Porsche brakes and Here Porsche we go. mirrors. Of course, Porsche everything because Porsche. But it just like the commingling yeah. of those features, which are so identifiably Porsche and like on a street Audi, I think it's kind of neat that, yeah. that, that they bothered to do that. Yeah. It's like a home, a factory made tuner car. Except that those were 10 valves? They? No, they're 20 valves. They're 20 valves? It's the hotter version. So my it's car, the reason part of why it exploded is because it had an RS2 turbo on it. It's the same motor in a different state of tune. Exploded. The, sorry, the turbo strong. exploded. I mean, it sounded better. When, like Part of the reason why it exploded. Um, no, I think that is genuinely one of the hottest cars. What I like about wagons is, is that you don't have the compromise of an SUV. You don't have the high ride, ride height, the high center of gravity, the extra mass. Like the wagon versus the sedan, the only real engineering drawbacks are typically, number one, the, sh the, sh the chassis of the car is not a strong, as strong because on a sedan you have the rear bulkhead that holds the seats together and that's a stiffening member. Um, and therefore that also leads to noise. You don't have noise isolation from, from the trunk, all mm -hmm. that other stuff. Um, they're a little bit heavier yep. and that weight is further back outside the wheelbase and up top where the hinge mechanism is. So that adds some, some weight dynamic and compromise. some dynamic compromises along with the lack of uh, strength. Um, worse aero. And worse aero. And, but we're talking about... I think my car has one mile per hour less top speed than the sedan version. Right. I think it's 148 instead of 149. So think about hour. this. They, it, this is one mile an hour less. What would that thing have been like if it was turned into a truck, an SUV? Like how much top speed would it have lost? How much handling would it have lost? It would have lost 15, 20 miles an hour. It would have lost everything that made it cool. And it would suck like an SUV. Yeah, sucky it's kind of vehicle. part of the, the company culture here also at ECB. I've noticed there's a preponderance of yeah. wagons. Everyone has one. I so have there two. Is, so you have a the 200, the Audi 200. Mm -hmm. You just bought a, a, two, a blue on blue E500 wagon. It's a W211. 211. Okay. So it's a 2004. It I haven't seen it yet. So. Yeah, neither have I. <laughs> it hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> you bought it sight unseen? Yeah. Again? Okay, I thought you flew out and looked at it at least. Okay. No, 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 no. So you have an Audi 200, um, uh, an S5, uh, the, an E500, mm -hmm. formatic. Um, Correct. I have the E30, mm -hmm. and then all also among the company fleet. Yeah, we have another E500 wagon that's also blue, blue, mm -hmm. and an E63 wagon, mm -hmm. and a W123 300 TD in black. Which is yeah, really all cool. of them are blue except for the so that's black. what six wagons out of a total of seven people. Seven or eight, eight people. Eight people? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. I think that means that ECME stands for good the taste in the wagons in Italian. I, I don't know anything about this newfangled technology. What, the whole podcast thing? Yes. All right, so the most important thing for you to know is that Carmudgeon is every week. Every week you can get a Carmudgeon show and it's broadcast on YouTube in this video format, but really you don't actually need to look at us. You can download it on your favorite podcast provider, provided that provider is either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or Google Podcasts. So go and subscribe to the podcast, get notified every single week that a new one's available, and you'll listen to us. Be Carmudgeon. Car Carmudgeonly. Car car about Or Carmudgeonly, if you prefer. Carmudgeonly? Yes. Do you just make this shit up? <laughs>